The Holy Spirit is a person. He's not a ghost. He's not a force. He's not an it. He's not impersonal. He's personal. He's not distant. He is near to help when you are discouraged, to teach when you're confused, to remind when you're afraid, and to guide you when you are lost. Friends, the Holy Spirit is a person, someone for you to interact with, someone for you to relate to, someone for, someone for you to rely upon. The Holy Spirit is a person. I don't know if you've had to carry something recently that was awkward or maybe a little bit extra heavy. I have, and it started when I got a text from my kids and it said, we need, which parents, you ever like hearing from your kids, we need, I'm like, you don't need anything. (laughs) But our TV that had been handed down to us um, had had its kind of was on its last leg. And so I get a text, we need a TV. And so I said, okay, since you need something. And so we got in the, the Subaru and, and drove down to the big box store and we, we, we found the one that we wanted to get and, you know, carrying it to the store. And then we get out, it's raining and, and you know, working with my older son to kind of get it positioned in the car. It's a little awkward, you know, difficult to do that by yourself. So I'm thankful for sons who can, can help, right, dads, that can help carry the load. And so we get home and again, my, my son's figured it out. If you're, if you're working with someone and you're carrying something that's heavy, you, you always want to be facing the direction you're going. And he's gotten really good at making me the one walk backwards, even though I got a gimped ankle. He doesn't seem to care. But we, um, we carry the, the, the TV that we needed and, and got it all set up. But you know, it's things when they're heavy or awkward, it, it's hard to carry them by yourself. It's probably not a good idea to carry those things alone. And it got me thinking spiritually that, you know, following Jesus is maybe not something we're meant to do alone. It, it's something where we need help. And, and Jesus gives us help on how to pursue him, how to follow him, how to live like him. And the help that he gave us is the help of the Holy Spirit. And I appreciate what one pastor who has studied the Holy Spirit, what he says about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. The doctrine of the Holy Spirit is buried dynamite. I love that, buried dynamite. Its power awaits discovery and use by the church. And that's my hope that we uncover this dynamite of the Holy Spirit and we use it and we experience its power as a church and as individuals. But in order to discover and to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit, we need to understand that there are some misunderstandings related to the Holy Spirit. You see, we have God the Father, and many of us are fathers or we've had a father. And so we can relate to this idea of God being a father. And throughout scripture, we have multiple scriptures and passages that talk about God as father. And we also have God, the son. Some of us are sons, we've had sons. And so we can kind of relate to and understand God as son, as Jesus. And the Bible has a lot to say about the son. We have four bios, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that that talk about who Jesus is and what he has done. And then there is the Holy Spirit. There's not a concrete image that we have. And so it leads to misunderstandings, a vagueness about the Holy Spirit. So there's misunderstandings, but there's also misconceptions. We call it the Holy Ghost. And so when some people think of the Holy Spirit, they think of Casper, like in a bed sheet, or we have a lot of Star Wars fans. And so when they think of the Holy Spirit, they think of this force of some kind, or for some, they grew up thinking that the Holy Spirit was an it, and it. And so these misconceptions and, and these misunderstandings lead Christians to, to see the Holy Spirit as anonymous, as faceless. And it causes the Holy Spirit to be overlooked. And also misunderstandings and misconceptions can lead to Christians treating the doctrine of the Holy Spirit like, sin, like the Cinderella of Bible doctrines, just not really interested or kind of put off. So we need to understand as we come to our 
teaching series on the Holy Spirit, we need to understand that there are misunderstandings, that there are misconceptions that we have to face, that we have to realize. And as I was studying in my personal time last fall, and as I was reading about the Holy Spirit, and and I'm reading of how the Holy Spirit is overlooked and how he's faithless, I'm, I'm going, yes. And then I went, yes, meaning I'm guilty. I'm guilty of treating the Holy Spirit as impersonal and as distant. And so I'm just as guilty as the next person when it comes to maybe not fully understanding who the Holy Spirit is and what he has done. And yes, the Bible has a lot to say about the Father. Yes, the Bible has a lot to say about the Son. And thankfully, Jesus, in his final lecture to his disciples before his crucifixion, He's with them and he's teaching and he concentrates on the Holy Spirit. It's probably the most extensive teaching on the Holy Spirit we have in our book. And we find it in John chapter 14. And I would love for you to join me in John chapter 14. And while you're turning there, let me set up the scene of what's going on with Jesus and his disciples. Let me set the context. And as I do, try to picture yourself in this scene, in this setting. It's a Thursday and it's time for for Jesus to gather with his disciples in the upper room. And it's Thursday and Jesus knows the time has now come. Meaning Jesus knows the cross is right in front of him. And even though he knows his death is fast approaching, it says that he serves his disciples, even his enemy, Judas, by washing their feet. Just think about this. The end is right there. And what does he do? He takes up a towel and he begins to serve. And we know that Judas is primed and ready to portray Jesus. And the scripture says that Jesus is feeling overwhelmed because he knows what Judas is gonna do, but he also knows that one of his own, Peter, will deny him. And so the scripture says Jesus is overwhelmed. The disciples are also overwhelmed in in this moment. And Jesus says to them, he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And then in verse 16, he says this to his disciples. I will ask the father, and he will give you another helper so that he may be with you forever. The helper is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he remains with you and will be in you. And then jump with me to verse 26. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and remind you of all that I said to you. In three verses that we've just read, Jesus tells the Holy Spirit helps, the Holy Spirit teaches, the Holy Spirit reminds. Friends, these are personal actions. These are actions of a person. And if you look and you see the next chapter, Jesus is going to say that the Holy Spirit will testify. He will give witness and he will also, the Holy Spirit will guide. In our study of the book of Ephesians, we found that in Ephesians chapter four, verse 30, it says the Holy Spirit can be grieved. The Holy Spirit can feel sorrow. In the context of Ephesians, it's when we use our our words to tear others down, it grieves the Holy Spirit. Maybe you've experienced that with a friend at school, maybe you've experienced that in your marriage or someone with work. You, you've said something or something was said to you and you were grieved. And in being grieved, you, you kind of distanced yourself from your spouse or from your coworker or your classmate. Well, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit can be grieved by our actions. These are all personal actions. And did you notice that the Holy Spirit is a He, he may be with you forever. And so that the Holy Spirit is a he and that he performs these personal actions. Here's the first first truth we see this morning. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's not a ghost. He's not a force. He's not an it. 
He's not impersonal. He's personal. He's not distant. He is near to help when you are discouraged, to teach when you're confused, to remind when you're afraid, and to guide you when you are lost. Friends, the Holy Spirit is a person someone for you to interact with, someone for you to relate to, someone for, someone for you to rely upon. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's a person. He's not an it, this force out there or this ghost-like figure. The Holy Spirit is a person. And look down with me at verse 26. Jesus calls the Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. And then in chapter 17, Jesus refers to the Father as Holy Father. And so what we see with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Father, we see that holy represents a person as God. And Jesus calls both the Spirit and the Father holy, holy. And then if we could, for just a moment, Go with me to Acts chapter five. The church is beginning to explode. People are coming to faith in Jesus. People are being baptized and needs are are being met. And there was a family, there was a couple that they went and sold some of their property, but they weren't honest on what they made from it. And so they come and they, they give what they've, been, what they've received and they lay it at the disciples' feet. And in Acts chapter five, we hear Peter say this to this couple. But Peter said, Ananias, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Ananias, you're not being truthful. You're lying to the Holy Spirit. Peter goes on and he says, while it remained unsold, did not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? And he goes on, he says, you have not lied to men, but to who? God. So do you see what Peter did here in this passage, in this context? God and the Holy Spirit are interchangeable, meaning the Holy Spirit is God. We also know this, and the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, do you not know that you are a temple of God? And he goes on and says, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. And so there are times in scripture when the Holy Spirit is used interchangeably with God. And these are two examples. And so here's the point. Yes, the Holy Spirit is a person, but the Holy Spirit is God. He's God. He's not the one that kind of tags along with the Father and the Son. He is God. He's the third member of our triune God. And for the sake of time, I would love to turn your attention to TBC's doctrinal statement on the Holy Spirit, on the Trinity. It says, we believe in one triune God existing in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Each is eternal. So the Holy Spirit is eternal, just as God is the Father and just as God the Son. And being identical in essence, equal in power and glory, and has the same attributes and perfections. And so what we know from the scripture is the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is a person. And last but not least, the Holy Spirit is with you and in you. And this is a great encouragement to me. Look with me back at verse 17. The helper is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you will know him because he remains with you and will be in you. And so if you underline or you highlight your Bible, highlight that the Holy Spirit is with you and in you. What an encouragement. What an encouragement. But before the Holy Spirit can be with you and in you, he must indwell you. He must indwell you. And we find this when the Apostle Paul is writing to Titus. 
As the Apostle Paul writes to Titus, he speaks of the, the work that the Holy Spirit does, the, the rebirth that the Holy Spirit brings in Titus chapter three, verse four and five. But when the kindness of God, our savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us. And I wanna be so clear on this because there are many that believe one is saved and reconciled to God by their good deeds. But the scripture is very clear. We are not saved, not on the basis of deeds which we did in righteousness. Even our righteous, our right, our good deeds cannot save us. But in accordance with his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. For the Spirit can be with us and in us, he must indwell us. This is salvation. This is justification. When the Holy Spirit makes his home in your heart. This is what we call salvation. And what's amazing is that when you become a Christian, your life is changed. Your life is transformed. And we find this in another key passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. The apostle Paul is writing this church about their behaviors. They're, and he says this, flee sexual immorality. Every other sin that a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? When the Spirit of God indwells you, your heart becomes his home whom you have from God and that you are not your own for you have been bought for a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. So the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit is a person and he is God and he is with you and in you. Your body is his home. And here's the big idea for all of us. You are never alone. If you are a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit is with you and in you, there is not one second, one moment where you are alone. There are several phrases we have with our kids, and this is one of them. You are never alone. You may feel like you're alone. You're never alone because the Holy Spirit is with you. You may feel isolated or rejected at work or at school, but as a Christian, you are never alone. Verse 16 says the Holy Spirit's with you forever. What an amazing truth. We're never alone. So you don't walk into work alone. You don't walk into your neighborhood alone. You don't walk into school alone. You have the Holy Spirit. And he is with you and in you, friends, to transform you. He's with you and in you to change you. You know, we're getting in, I guess, the spring garden season and we have a couple of raised beds. And you get these raised beds, red, beds ready and you, you put soil in them. And then you take seeds and you, you plant fruits and vegetables. And then there's a war that happens in that soil. And it's a war between weeds and fruits and vegetables. There's a tug of war that's happening in the soil. There is a war. And just as there is war in the soil in a garden, there is a war going on in your life. There is a tug of war that's happening inside of you as a Christian. There's a civil war, if you will. And we read about it in Galatians chapter five, verse 16. But I say, the apostle Paul writes, walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. And here's the war. For the desire of the flesh is against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another. And so friends, there is a civil war inside of you between the flesh and the spirit. There is a tug of war, a pulling against each other. And it keeps you from doing what you want to do. And what you want to do, you don't do because you have this civil war. And I believe if we're honest, 
We lean and we're bent towards the flesh. And Paul says, you're in this war. You have this internal war happening between the deeds of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit. And these could not be any different when you compare them. One is selfish and one is spiritual. And so how do we fight this battle? How do we win this battle? Paul tells us in verse 16, walk by the spirit. If you don't wanna practice the deeds of the flesh, then you walk by the spirit. Meaning you are led by the spirit. You are taught by the spirit. You are guided by the spirit. You are reminded by the spirit. You are yielding your life to the Holy Spirit's work in your life. Walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. So if you're warring against your flesh, maybe you need to do a checkup on how well or not well you are doing and walking in the spirit. This is something I have to do often, to do it often. You know, when you're gardening, there's only one way to get rid of weeds. You can't take a pair of scissors and just kind of trim off the top of the weeds. No, you have to get your hand or you've got to get a shovel and you've got to get down in the root of that weed and you've got to pull it out. Scripturally speaking, you've got to crucify the weed. You've got to get down in there and pull it out. And at the same time, you have to cultivate the fruits and the vegetables. In the same way as a Christian, we have to crucify, put to death the deeds of the flesh and at the same time, cultivate the Spirit's work in our life by yielding to the person of the Holy Spirit and allowing him to lead us, allowing him to guide us. And Paul says, when you walk by the Spirit, then you will not gratify and give in to the deeds of the flesh. And imagine what it would be like as a congregation, if we began to crucify the deeds of the flesh and we cultivated the fruit of the spirit in our lives. And notice it's the fruit of the spirit. Notice as you look at those characteristics, those qualities that we're trying to cultivate, it's not necessarily charismatic behavior, but Christ-like behavior. The fruit of the spirit is the portrait of Jesus. And so as we walk by the Holy Spirit, and follow in his direction, you and I become more and more like Jesus Christ. See, the Holy Spirit is with you and in you to transform you, to change you, to guide you, to remind you, and to lead you. And so for the next several weeks, we want to uncover, if you will, the dynamite of the Holy Spirit so that we can realize its power and walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and change our lives, change the lives of those around us and change the, let's see, the lives of those in our community also change. Amen? Amen. Would you please stand with me as we take a moment to pray? Let us pray. Our great God and loving Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for this moment that we gather together around your word. And Father, as we've listened in, as we've opened our hearts to receive your word, I pray that the teaching of your word has been a demonstration, not of the power of man, but of the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit so that you can do a work in each and every person. And Father, for those who, like Paul talks about, need to wake up, would you this morning, would you wake them up to who the Holy Spirit is and what he wants to do and what he has to offer? Would you wake us up? 
for the one this morning that is without the Holy Spirit, we pray the Holy Spirit would begin the work of regeneration, the, the work of the rebirth, the work of salvation. And as a church, over the next few weeks, Father, help us, help us to study and to grasp the Holy Spirit and His person and His work so that we can become more and more like your son, Jesus Christ. And help us to crucify the deeds of the flesh and help us to cultivate the fruit of the spirit. And we pray this in Jesus' great name, amen.